Hi, and welcome to my channel Ongeduld. And this time for a quick review of The End of History and the Last Man by Francis Fukuyama. A quick note, as you might have noticed, I've switched from Dutch to English. This is for two fold of reasons. Um, first, I have uh, some international friends and also a family. Um, the family of my girlfriend who lives in Finland, um, who also sometimes motivated me to try and do some book reviews in English. So it might have a broader reach and I can find more people with the same interest. Also, and that's the second reason, I thought about it myself. Um, I liked the sort of the Dutch focused channel, but I noticed that um, sometimes I was looking for more interaction. I had quite a lot of interaction, would I, which I loved, but I was looking for maybe also a more broader community of international um, relationships with other people who also have, for example, channels regarding philosophy, uh, literature, uh, sociology, and I, that was missing a bit for me. So I decided to switch it up um, to at least try and make some English speaking videos, see how it goes, um, and to see if it works. Um, I'm sorry if I disappointed some of my viewers, um, but yes, that's what I'm going to try to do from now on uh, for a little while and see how it goes. So I hope that a lot of you will still follow me and will still appreciate the videos. Um, but yes, that's it. Um, so, The End of History and The Last Man by Francis Fukuyama. Um, when I was a bit younger, I read this book on identity and I liked it, uh, but I didn't think that much of it. Uh, but via his book, so on identity, I came uh, in contact with this book. And for the viewers that follow me quite a long time, uh, I did study psychology, um, which I which I loved. I mean, it's it's a it's a great a great university degree. Uh, but I switched it up. I switched it up. I always had a more uh, an inclination for social psychology, and um, so well with that sort of motivation for social psychology, I decided to do a soci uh, sociological master. And I do a sociological master in politics and society. So they combine the two. And here too, uh, Fukuyama was sort of mentioned. And we read a bit about him and about his uh, political philosophy. So when I was in the bookstore I and I saw his book, I immediately, I immediately bought it. And to be honest, it was a, a very interesting book. Um, Especially because I didn't really buy into his core ID. So what 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 his core ID is, is that he sees and he decided at the, the date that he was writing this book that the current sort of hegemony of democratic liberal societies were the end point of history, and he got a lot of critic critical remarks from it um, because well there were still sort of a lot of troubles and there were still um, well sort of communist countries for example look at China but also dictatorships look at for example North uh, Korea and how could he have stated that that this liberal democracy was really the end point of history um, and to be honest I quite agreed with these statements and I still partly do, but I was curious on how he sort of argumented in favor of this. Um, so that's why I read his book and um, what he sets out is okay, he, he, makes, he makes this very bold statement. So he states that indeed the liberal democracy is the end point of history, but then immediately he nuances it. So he states that he does not mean the end of literal history. It isn't the fact, I mean, we're, we are still living. It wasn't the fact that at that point it was just done. We sort of reached the end of the game and that was it. No, he meant the Hegelian sort of sense of the word history, um, which I wasn't familiar with. Uh, I'm, not a really, uh, I'm not really a Hegelian expert. Uh, I've read some of Hegel's work uh, in my philosophy courses, but still <laughs> not enough to fully understand or directly understand what he meant. So what he, he means is that um, Hegel saw history as a continuation of evolving processes, especially within ideas. So ideas were consistently progressing towards an endpoint. Um, and this endpoint wasn't a literal endpoint, but an endpoint in a sort of 
finalized ID. And this finalized ID um, was found in, in the most in, in, in the concept that could give and bring the most freedom, um, which was founded in rationality and self-awareness. So within the process of rationality and the consistent rationalization um, of human societies and humans in general, came also a, a sense of self-awareness. And with it, uh, we founded freedom. And the concept of freedom that was expanding um, was founded eventually um, in the liberal dem democratic state. So what we found, or what Fukuyama states, is that within the liberal democratic state, there's a, there the most freedom is found, so to say. So via rationality and self-awareness, um, we found within the liberal democratic state the uh, most amount of freedom, which is why he proposes that in this particular um, type of society, um, we found the end point of history in the Hegelian sense of the word. So, and what what Fukuyama does in the book, and I, was, I will first give a quick overview of sort of his core arguments, uh, basing on this uh, Hegelian uh, concept, and then I will go into uh, well, a few more details on particular um, chapters of the book. So what he does is he gives an economic and a philosophical argument for this. So what he first does is he, he, argue, he argues that if we look at world history, we see that there's a decline in fascist states, in, nationals, uh, in very nationalistic states, in um, communist states. Uh, so over the last century and also within this one, there's a decline. And we see that they are getting replaced by liberal democratic systems, which indicates to him that indeed um, this is the more rational choice and the better choice, so to say. Um, then he states, based on this Hegelian concept um, and further elaborating on Hegel, that um, society's progress as I mentioned earlier, via this continuation of evolutionary processes of, uh, or yes, processes of ideas. But they also, more on a, a microscopic level, or not microscopic, but a micro level, via the master slave dialectic. So, what Fukuyama states, based on Hegel, is that. Um, Society exists of humans, which is logical. And we exist of three different parts. This is desire, rationality, and themos, or thymos. I don't know exactly how it is pronounced. And this third part is our sort of self-awareness, our sense of pride and our sense of worthiness, so to say. Um, and this sense of worthiness, this motivates us to um, for example, be mad if um, something, someone does not treat us with the proper respect that we think we deserve. Um, so, and this themos is based in also recognition of um, by other humans. So we want to be recognized as the humans that we are, um, and within our proper worth, so to say. So, evolving from this themos, there is a consistent battle between people. Um, people try to uh, be recognized by another, and this ends up consistently in these battles. And within these battles, there um, Hegel sees freedom. So, because it's not motivated, by a sort of deterministic biological sense. It isn't based on hunger or sexuality or, uh, for example, even the need to sleep. No, it's based by this concept of pride, this sort of cultural, moralistic concept. And because this is, this is a sort of cultural concept, there he sees a part of freedom. Because, and there we look back at the liberal democratic states, in the end it might be possible for 
everyone to be recognized within their themos or thymos. But first, Fukuyama explains that within this battle uh, that people undergo, there's always sort of a winner and a loser, or the master and the slave, or the lord and the bondage. So there's always one who wins and one who loses. And here comes the final part of Fukuyama's explanation of his philosophical argument, so to say. So we have these battles coming from, coming from of these themos. And the loser, he becomes sort of a slave to the master. The loser does not have any sort of self-word. He is not recognized by the master as a full human being, so he is not recognized in his humanness, in his themos. But also the master, while he is recognized, he is not fully recognized, because he is recognized by the slave, a not fully human being. And there the concept of the liberal democracy comes forward, which found a way to recognize all, to see all in their proper humanness, so to say. Um, and that's where Fukuyama finds his more philosophical argument. So we have the economic argument, which states that, or the political uh, realistic argument, where we see that indeed there is a decline in fascist and communist states, and there is an increase in liberal democratic states. And contrasting to that, well not contrasting, but next to it, we have the philosophical argument, which is based on Hegel's concept of the uh, the dialectic, or the, or, or the master-slave dialectic, and the progression towards the recognition of all within the liberal democratic state. So let me quickly check if I missed anything very important. I don't think I did. Um, only that uh, Themos was uh, used, or first used, by Plato in his uh, book The Republic. And, um, to give a very good explanation of it, Themos is an innate sense of human justice of which self-esteem, pride, and this need for recognition comes forward of. So here we see a better definition or a more concrete definition of Themos. Um, yes. Furthermore, it's important to explain that um, Hegel's concept of liberalism was different from John Locke's and Thomas Hobbes' concept of liberalism. So, as I earlier explained, um, Hegel and Fukuyama see three different parts in the humanness, sort of. Uh, we have the desire part, the rational part, and then, um, at last, we have thymos, or themos. And um, Hegel, sorry, uh, Locke and Hobbes mostly focused on the desire part and the rational part. So, their concept of liberalism ends up in um, a society where rationality rules and um, there's a sort of rational base for striving for your own desires. And just as a warning, I don't know enough about Locke or Hobbes to give my own very uh, critical remarks on uh, this interpretation by Fukuyama. But this is how he describes it. So they focus mostly on this desire part and rational part in which you say, okay, it's most rational if we all treat each other as, as equals because then uh, we can all strive for our own desires in a rational way uh, because we do not fight uh, and we are all happy, sort of. And this leaves out a moral aspect which is centered in Thymos because uh, as I mentioned earlier, Thymos was the, the, the self-recognition of self-worth and is always fought over um, big battles in which you can prove your humanness. And um, here, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Hegel sees this concept of freedom, but also morality and culture. So, in his concept of liberalism, there is this freedom, but also this option to strive for certain things beyond us to find recognition of your peers and of your friends and of your enemies. So, for example, a good way to 
um, or also given by Fukuyama to see this 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 battle is is by uh, fighting other knights. So uh, literally by fighting another knight and winning, you get recognition by everyone around you. That increases sort of your self worth, but also proves that you're human and proves that you are there, that you are recognized by others. Okay. Um, a very short summary um, of my interpretation of this was that I found Hegel, uh, sorry, not Hegel, Fukuyama, um, a bit like Steven Pinker, because he has a very optimistic worldview, um, which he proves by uh, via statistics also and economics. I mean, Steven Pinker sometimes misses the philosophical arguments, um, which Fukuyama does mention, but. In the end, both think that there is an increase in overall prosperity, in overall, um, well, in the overall goodness of society, so to say, and they see that there is a progression and an increase in in everything that is well and good. And um, I will nuance this later on, but I found some references between Stephen Pinker and Francis Fukuyama. Okay, so. Some chapters that I found pretty interesting um, is we have the first introduction, and in the introduction, there Francis Fukuyama gives his overview, which I just mentioned. So he explains very shortly, very quickly, but also very clearly, which I really appreciated and also found really interesting because he, I mean, he comes up with a lot of big names. I mean, Hegel, um, Rousseau, uh, Locke, Hobbes. Um, he mentions all these big names, but he does it well, and he does it in a way that also, um, well, that I could understand it, and that I, who does have a bit of a sort of a, uh, a history within philosophy, but also not a major one, could understand what was going on, and he could explain a, um, a concept such as the, the master-slave dialectics in a way that I found very clear and very interesting. Um, so that was amazing, and if you can find this summary also online of the of the first chapter, or um, definitely look it up because it just gives you a very quick overview without reading uh, some 350 <laughs> pages. So definitely try to look it up. Um, so let's start in the second part of the book because I already mentioned. So the first part of the book, so the book is divided by multiple parts. Uh, five parts, if I remember correctly, with different chapters in it, so that's just a quick note. Uh, but let's start with the second part of the book. And here uh, I found chapter 5 especially interesting, because there he tries to make uh, a start of uh, the concept of universal history. So uh, there are thinkers, such as, well, uh, I think one of the most famous ones is Oswald Spengler, who see uh, society and also history as a sort of organistic process. So. Um, societies, um, they 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 uh, start like a like a flower as a very small seed, and they sprout up, and they become this this beautiful flower or tree eventually, um, and then over time they go to different seasons, and eventually they all die and um, go back to the ground, and they do not exist anymore. And every flower and every tree is sort of a special part. They are not interconnected together. Um, and this is a sort of organistic view in which uh, different society rises or rise and fall. Um, while more enlightenment thinkers, and especially the idealistic thinkers such as Kant and Hegel, saw history more as a linear progress. And Fukuyama once, and this is also uh, a point that I found very interesting and very, um, well, I mean, he dared a lot by doing this, uh, because if we look at our current society, there's a more pessimistic view, and especially regarding the sort of linear progress of society with, uh, for example, climate, ch ch climate change, with uh, the current wars going on, people are quite pessimistic, and he tries to argue that there is indeed a sort of positive positive trend um, of societies building on top of each other towards a higher end goal. And he tries to explain this in, in chapter 5, where he indeed, um, well, 
connects the, the liberal democracy to the recognition, uh, the, th the themos that we earlier explained, um, to see and explain that there is indeed a rise in freedom, in rationality and in self-esteem or self-awareness that we see throughout history towards this endpoint. And then what I found really interesting also in the second part is chapter 10. And in chapter 10, um, he tries to, uh, to connect this. So first he says, in, uh, there's also in, this is also in chapter 5, that you see this trend. And he connects this trend to the natural sciences. So he, um, at a certain point, states that the natural sciences uh, develop consistently. And um, the natural sciences form his core argument for this universal history. Because the natural sciences... Um, they show a universal history. They show that there is a linear progression. They indeed state that, um, well, if you look at the, the sciences of the 7th century, you can see a linear progression towards where we are now. And also, and this is very, very important, the, the natural sciences combine national um, governments and countries. So, you cannot stay behind if the environment around you is progressing. Um, even look, for example, at North Korea. You can be very much against a certain sense of technology or um, uh, sort of Americanization, uh, but you are still, you still, uh, even for defensive purposes, need to modernize and need to be need to catch up with the current sort of natural sciences to protect yourself and defend yourself, um, or to shoot missiles <laughs> over Japan. Um, so yes, the, the, the natural sciences show, and um, for Fukuyama, are the fundament behind his universal history argument. Via these natural sciences, he can indeed say that there is a sort of a universal history towards a specific end goal. And in chapter 10, he tries to explain, via education, that um, this modernization of sciences have led to industrialization, and combined with education, so education is the sort of the, the, the mechanism between industrialization and the natural sciences and in the end the liberal democracy. Uh, because what he tries to do is he tries to argue that um, with the rise of, of the natural sciences, one's citizens uh, need, need, well, need to be educated, they need to have the capacity to um, understand these sciences and to work with them, but also to develop more. And in this education, Fukuyama sees um, the link that's needed to connect it to liberal democracy. Because, for example, and he gives three arguments, um, First one, uh, the first one is based on Talcott Parson. He states that in this industrialized society, where there are a lot of different interests, uh, and a lot of people would, would well, different interests that also collide um, and sometimes uh, do not work together. A de democratic system, especially a liberal democratic system, is the best or system to uh, work together and to um, find a sort of consensus within these problems. Um, secondly, he states that, um, and this is more a argument not really not directly in favor of democratic systems, but more against authoritarian systems and communist systems. Um, Fukuyama states that elites under an authoritarian regime will uh, eventually become frustrated because they cannot really express their ambitions. And because they cannot uh, sort of, well, express their ambitions, they finally move from an authoritarian regime towards a democratic regime or not regime, but democratic system. Uh, because in this system they can better explain uh, and also act out their ambitions. And then lastly, industrialization has created a middle, middle class. So the, uh, and the middle class is more highly educated, has more free time, uh, which they can also spend um, well, discussing politics, um, and they also demand this participation within politics. So these are his arguments of 
um, how industrialization led to the need for education and also how this then affected the need for a liberal democratic system. Interesting enough, I recently read a paper also for my study that indicates that um, the higher one's, one is educated, um, the more the sort of sense for liberalism increases and the more one um, also wants to participate within democracy, understands this, these uh, important concepts of democracy um, and yeah, sees this need for liberalism, uh, which worrisome enough uh, isn't the case for the lower educated, uh, but there's, this is another topic. So we'll go on. We'll go to part three of the book. And I quickly need to watch very angrily if someone wants to turn down their phone. <laughs> but um, then, in part three of the book, this philosophical argument is explained more in depth. So here, um, Fukuyama um, tries to explain this master-slave dialectic, combined to national countries, uh, which also, um, in his opinion, have this need for a themos, which eventually creates a democratic system. Um, and he bases this also on the on the interpretation by Alexander Koyefe, if I uh, name his name correctly, um, of his explanation uh, of Hegel. Um, I found this chapter a bit... Uh, well, I found it interesting, um, but not as much as the, as the other chapters. Um, so here again, he explains also the difference between Hegel and Hobbes and Locke. Um, and that's and that I mean that was really interesting and I misspoke I'm sorry part four was less interesting so here the uh, interconnectedness of the states are portrayed more so part three is just again a repetition of themos and the master slave dialectic part four uh, I personally found less interesting because there um, he explains how Themos then again um, connects to the national states. Which is fine, which is interesting, which explains his argument a bit more, uh, but I found it less interesting. But, and this was really interesting, we have chapter 26. And in chapter 26, Fukuyama nuances his position. And this is something that I did not know and I found really interesting. So what he does is he mentions that, um, yes, in his opinion, we have reached the end point of history. Uh, and yes, uh, in his opinion, this is the liberal democratic states, uh, which still have uh, its uh, well, it still has its its, um, its problems and its limitations, but nothing as concrete um, and as fundamentally challenging that it could under or it could destroy sort of the concept of the liberal democracy. No, this is the end point. But what does this mean? This means that we do not have a ideological discussion anymore. We do not have the, um, the battles of great big powers that fight over the right way to go forward. Before the, the Iron Wall fell down, especially the Berlin Wall, we had these divisions and we had these very thought out ideological uh, ways of thinking, for example, so the, the communist versus the capitalist. Um, and now with the, the, the end point of the liberal democracy, we are there. And, this, and we, we, do not longer, we do no longer have these discussions, it's just gone. We have the, our economic discussions and that's it. Later you can argue, of course, that now we have the uh, problems of nationalism, of populism, um, and maybe some other troubles that we can mention. But indeed, here Fukuyama nuances his own position and also gives his more worrisome answer. And he shows us that he is not only a very Enlightenment style thinker that um, sees this progression as consistently positive. No, he also sees the darker sides of it. And there we go to chapter five. And this is the last chapter, which I think most of you would really like, especially if you are more interested in the philosophical wing of his argumentation, because there he gives a, a um, argument against this 
concept of uh, equal recognition because the liberal democracy based on this um, idea of themos and the recognition of all has as, a, as its core principle sort of equality equality for all so a grounded equality for all sometimes um, based in the state who gives away certain rights um, such as the human rights for example but it's it's equality for all and here Fukuyama tries to mention uh, ways that the extreme left or the left in general uh, and the right or extreme right can um, attack his position and first he mentions the left who in his conception can argue against this concept of equality um, because Fukuyama still uses the capitalist system so he does not delve deeply into how capitalism fits into his system but it's clear that he accepts it and it's clear that he does not critique it and the left could argue that capitalism cannot or at least a liberal democratic system cannot and uh, will not provide equality for all in a capitalist system because there there are still inequalities based on age based on education based on well you name it there is a consistent discussion about this so there will still be inequalities and equal equality cannot be um, given away and cannot be promised in uh, Fukuyama's concept but then he goes to the, the right-wing argument and there he bases his argumentation on Nietzsche so he bases his argumentation also on sort of the Ubermensch uh, and on Nietzsche's concept of needing to strive for a better position than the people around you so where Fukuyama and Hegel argue that uh, equality and recognition of one another on an equal basis will lead to a good societal system um, in Fukuyama's interpretation of Nietzsche Nietzsche argues that uh, creativity and values and morality uh, also comes of a sort of battle of being better than others being or doing better than others and being I think a sort of ubermensch although again caution I am not familiar with Nietzsche's work enough to really critique Fukuyama on this so he, be, he looks at Nietzsche and this concept of being or, or striving to be better than others um, where it is potential for where cultural creativity and morality lies and he noticed that within his system or this system that Fukuyama set up there is equality which is mostly based on self-preservation so we are all equal and we all live another day um, but that's it we do not strive for anything we do not fight for anything there is no there is no battle left as mentioned by Hegel that could indicate a more creative pr uh, process or give rise to these ideological battles that we mentioned earlier so in a sense we are men with hollow chests as Fukuyama writes it down and also here Fukuyama uses or combines Nietzsche with uh, which uh, Tocqueville's analysis of America um, because if we all live in a certain self-preservation and there is no consistent battle there is no relationship sort of connecting us with, you, with, with each other so we all live we are all recognized by our being so we just consume and live and consume more and exist that's it um, and here both Nietzsche and uh, Tocqueville argue that this sort of slow degeneration of this um, you know, master-slave dialectic um, takes away our sense of community our sense of uh, a collectivity so to say and it, it ends up by us all being individuals 
with hello chests and that's it so in the end what does Fukuyama say well he states that he thinks that this relativism that in the end will happen uh, if we follow this uh, it's logic um, that there will be a way that people will resolve this and that in the end it will all be okay um, and we'll have our liberal democracy but he is still worried and he isn't sure and he nuances himself quite a lot um, so in the end we'll just have to wait and see I don't think that I will still exist to see if indeed our liberal democracy is the end form uh, is the end point but it's still quite interesting and I still enjoyed it quite a lot to just read through his argumentation and especially the philosophical arguments also the sociological part on education but especially the philosophical arguments uh, which are given um, are just interesting to read you don't read a lot of people who advocate for a universal history anymore for a um, an end point in history indeed and to see the rise of a uh, certain rationality especially in these times so if you want to read a sort of hopeful book um, well hopeful he nuances that too uh, but then again if you want to read a interesting argumentation of which you can agree but also um, well, can disagree with then this is a really interesting read oh and one point before I forget it uh, two points actually I also loved how he um, set out his divide between Marx and Hegel so um, he writes that within this master-slave dialectic uh, Marx mostly focused on this uh, materialistic battle that eventually came forth out of this uh, master-slave bondage or a uh, master-slave dialectic um, and how Hegel then sees the more moralistic part of it which was interesting um, okay and the second point is I have a website uh, most of the reviews are in Dutch um, but I translated them uh, or at least it's an automatic translation so please feel free to have a look uh, I'm afraid that my, all my other videos are in Dutch um, but I hope to make more English videos and then again I hope to see you soon and I'm happy to be back thanks